it's like solving a jigsaw puzzle biology gives you some set of hints and your model gives you a full set of computations and then it's a question of how do you map these computations we had to put in there because that that's the only way to make the model work and then <laughs> when we worked back from that to see where it would fit there was no place to fit it other than in the thalamus <laughs> This is Brain Inspired. Hey, it's Paul. Once again today, I have Dalip George on. Uh, because last time he was on, we ran out of time to talk about what he's uh, back today to talk about. And that is his recent work that maps his model for visual inference onto the circuitry of the cortical column in combination with the thalamus uh, to account for the function of the loops of connections between the cortex and thalamus. The model I just mentioned is what we've discussed in previous episodes with Dilip, uh, which he calls a recursive cortical network, which is a generative probabilistic graph model for inferring the best explanation for visual evidence presented to the model. In this case, the RCN model, the recursive cortical network model, was adapted to account for the corticothalamic circuitry. Uh, and the way it turned out, Delip thinks of cortical columns as little belief machines uh, about some feature or concept about the world that you're perceiving. And the belief is informed by uh, sensory input, by top-down attention, and the context of everything else that's going on at the time or in the same scene. All that information goes into a vote on whether to believe the feature or concept that the cortical column stands for uh, sh should be present in your perception. So, um, I'm, I'm either on or I'm off. Uh, you do see an edge there or you don't, for instance. And this model gives the thalamus a, a crucial role for explaining away evidence uh, for other interpretations, as information gets processed up the hierarchy of vision. So we discussed the model and its functioning in more detail, and we compared a little bit with Randy O'Reilly's ideas about the thalamus providing a predictive learning mechanism uh, from a few episodes ago when Randy was on. Show notes are at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 93. If you value the podcast and can afford a couple bucks a month, consider supporting it on Patreon, Often I include extra bits of these regular episode conversations, and every once in a while I'll post a bonus episode. Uh, and I'm almost to the point now where I can start using some of the funds from the Patreon support to pay for a little help with things like editing and transcripts, um, which would help immensely. Anyway, Dilip won't be back on for a while, but he's always fun to talk with, so I hope you enjoy the conversation. Catherine! It's Dilip again! George! Vicarious! Yeah, can you come do your thing again? Okay. Okay, she's on her way here. Hang on. Previously on Brain Inspired. Thanks for coming on the show again, and we'll talk soon again, so I appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot for having me. And I hope I will come back again before two years. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Dalip, here we are. <laughs> Welcome back. Yes. <laughs> uh, great to be back. Uh, it hasn't been two years. It has been just a few weeks, I think. Only a few weeks, but I know of uh, at least two things that have happened uh, during that time. One, how was your RV trip? How was your first ever RV trip? Oh, that was so much fun. Um, the kids loved it. Um, and it was, uh, it was just one night of RV camping. But, you know, the, the whole experience was uh, fun. For me, it was first time driving a big truck, basically, and uh, uh, and then it was just get good to get out for a few days. Oh yeah, yeah. especially especially these days. Yeah, can you imagine? So you did it for one night. Uh, I did it for a year and a half. Although we had a we we towed a fifth wheel, which is like w the big ones that you tow. You know, in a we had to buy a monster truck and stuff. Do you think you could handle? A year and a half with the with the kids and everyone in there in, in wow. that little space. <laughs> so you did a, a year and a half with uh, in an RV with kids. 
Yeah. That and I'm still, I mean, I'm basically bald now. So, I mean, it's. <laughs> I would love to do that actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe you should, maybe we should talk before you just sell all your stuff and move into an RV like we did. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm glad, glad to hear that you got out and that it was fun. The other thing that, that happened is that uh, you published this nice review in Frontiers that details, you know, really your overall approach, but also, um, you know, is based on the recursive cortical networks that we've talked about a few times here already on the podcast. Yeah. And so, I, uh, you know, obviously, I'll, I'll link to that uh, review. It's a great review, by the way. Um, and I'll just, I have a few questions here related to that before we really get started. Okay. Um, so one of the things that, you know, you lay out what we mentioned, what you mentioned and described in the, in our, in the last episode, um, this triangle strategy that you employ for building AI. Basically, you, you use in parallel cognitive and neuroscience observations, and you match those with, uh, in parallel with computational algorithms and principles, and you match all of that uh, with the third node of the triangle, which are uh, properties of the real world. And that's a little bit reminiscent of Mars levels of uh, analysis. And I had a, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I had a, a listener question mm -hmm. um, about you trying to understand how the brain works. Yeah. The question is, how do you define the levels of abstraction uh, of the description of the brain uh, and, and what level are you working at in particular? So I just will throw it, throw it to you. Yeah. Um, the tricky part here is that you cannot uh, define a level of physical abstraction in the brain. You cannot, you cannot, uh, think of you're operating at neuron level, column level, or synapse level, or you cannot make any physical cutoff like that uh, because, uh, if you make a physical cutoff like that and if your overall system needs a mechanism that is below that level, then you will be missing that out. And, uh, and that's why we don't describe it in terms of a physical abstraction level, uh, like a cortical column or anything like that uh, in the brain. And it's more you look as deep as you need to, uh, but you uh, ignore irrelevant things at any level, any physical level uh, of abstraction. Um, so if something at the cortical column level is irrelevant for information processing, you ignore that. It is So this triangulation strategy is more for figuring out what is important for information processing at any physical level of implementation uh, versus and what is not relevant for information processing. Great. So ho hopefully that satisfies uh, uh, Jeff. Okay. Last question about this review. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll point people to it. But um, so in Vicarious, the, the goal is to build AGI. And one of the things that you write about uh, is uh, why why are we calling it AGI? Why not uh, AHI as in artificial uh, human intelligence? Or uh, And then so you make that distinction between artificial human intelligence and artificial general intelligence. And then you add in artificial universal intelligence. Yeah. So uh, how do you think about these things? What, 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 what is all that? What do you mean? Uh, yeah. So we need a term to refer to building of intelligence models after the human brain. And people have been calling it artificial general intelligence for a while, but there is some confusion. Um, and this confusion can be because of uh, uh, books like super intelligence being written where um, what is imagined is an arbitrarily powerful entity which would just instantaneously learn everything and take over the world and convert everything to paper clips, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. But uh, such things uh, are do not exist. There are fundamental limits on what even a general intelligence will be able to do, how quickly it will be able to learn new things, how quickly it will be able to um, disentangle the causal mechanisms, in the world so that it can uh, make decisions and drive actions so those fundamental limits will always put a you know uh, th there is a constraint on how quickly something can learn and act in the world um so th those are not constrained in this mythical super intelligence uh setting so that's why i call it some arbitrary artificial universal intelligence which is which is uh like perpetual machines you know you can imagine something like yeah. that existing but it w violates the laws of physics and uh, it, it uh, cannot exist. So that that's the thing I put in artificial universal intelligence. Like, you know, something that exists only in our imagination cannot be really built. Um, so then some people 
you know, since people were mischaracterizing general AGI as this AUI, some people uh, started basically saying that, oh, it should be just called uh, human intelligence, not uh, a- right. AGI. Um, but the problem there is that that also doesn't solve the problem because, you know, are you mo- going to model exactly like human intelligence? Like, are you going to put in uh, the working memory limitations that we have uh, right. just because, you know, we are we have some hardware limitations? Um, so are you going to impose all the arbitrary constraints that might be there on our own uh, intelligence? Um, are you not going to wire a Google search directly into the prefrontal cortex if you could? Uh, so it's basically whenever we are going to build something based on human intelligence, but on a different substrate, it will be more general than human intelligence just because of the way we are building it. So you you can think of, oh, I want to model human uh, intelligence exactly and try to build it, but you will end up building something that is more general. So that's why I like the term artificial general intelligence. It is not some arbitrarily universal intelligence, and it is not exactly trying to replicate uh, human intelligence uh, with all its limitations. So that's why I like the term AGI as something general intelligence model after the human brain. I, I like that too, and, and it's not subject to the same constraints physically, uh, you know, or, or just capacity-wise uh, as well. So I wonder. So then, so you kind of ha- have a hierarchy. There's artificial human intelligence, and then above that is artificial general intelligence. And the limiting fictional idea, theoretical, is artificial universal intelligence. Yeah. So then, below the human intelligence, what is that? Where is that? Is that me? Where am? I, where, <laughs> so is there a term for that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, computers or something. I, yeah. I, I would call them specialized intelligences. Like, you know, okay. Um, oh, no, good. Yeah. There's all the specialized <laughs> stuff. That's yes. pretty good. Okay. All right. So um, anyway, I enjoyed the uh, the review paper because it lays out. I mean, like I said, it just it lays out your approach and and gives examples that that we've talked about already on the podcast and that are in all these papers. So uh, yeah. in a very easily digestible manner. Okay. Glad you liked it. So uh, vicarious. I've I have just a couple things on vicarious, and then we're going to get into the meat of this thing. Okay. Okay. Doing things in general, and you know, creating startups, for instance. So. You know, it seems like 99% of startup ideas begin with the wrong idea. And you were talking about how important it is to listen to customers. And that's how, you know, it kind of shapes what you're building, not only the specifications uh, and the technical information, but the kind of things that you're making. Yeah. And so I'm I'm wondering, you know, does it even matter? How much does it matter what idea you start with, given that it's going to change probably dramatically? Well, uh, it matters in terms of uh, what is the skill set of people you are bringing in uh, and uh, what are your key people in the company as long as um, whatever you are uh, changing to uh, fits within the skill set of what those people can build uh, Mm. then I think it will be reasonably fine it will be very hard to pivot to something that is totally outside the scope of them like that will be almost like starting a new company do you think that's why a lot of startups fail? I mean, most startups fail for various reasons, but do you think that might be an underlying reason that when people have to quote unquote pivot, then their team or their technical s- skills aren't up to par for whatever the the end goal is at that point? I mean, there are multiple, multiple reasons, right? And depends yeah. on um, the different stages of the uh, company. Um, so at early stage, what I've seen are um, things falling apart, Sometimes just based on um, disagreements between the founders, they just, you know, w- try to work for a few mm-hmm. months together, just didn't pan out. They want to go in different directions. So at the very early stage, when it is two or three people in a garage kind of setting, it can, it can fall apart because, oh, just didn't uh, gel to work, working together. Uh, so that's, you know, one reason. And, and often it is just finding that core team that will stick it through. Which is the hard part, uh, you know, getting mm. a, uh, getting a co-founder and and or um, a key employee uh, employee number one, which becomes super important in the company. That that core team clicking together uh, can be a challenge, and uh, so that's a lot of ideas fall apart right at that stage, and then right, um, and then it is you know the the different gates uh, uh, that you have to pass through, uh, you know, seed, series A, series B, etc. So. And, and things can fall apart at the seed stage, 
where uh, oh you just the idea does not get any traction at all uh, where you talk to multiple people and just cannot raise any uh, any money and you might bootstrap it for some time but if it's not getting customer traction or if it is an idea that actually requires capital to get cap, you know customer traction then it will fall apart at that at, at that stage then uh, later on uh, what can happen is that you know companies can scale too quickly uh, because um, you always want to scale because there is a perceived customer demand but if you if you scale too quickly and then the customer demand doesn't materialize in time that's you know something can go wrong in later in the life cycle um then scaling too slowly sometimes can also be bad <laughs> you, <know>? so, <laughs> that's you make it sound so fun man <laughs> <laughs> because then somebody else scaled faster than you uh, yeah. uh when uh, yeah. so uh yeah so there are many many things that can uh, uh go wrong um we know the kosla uh, has a nice analogy um uh for uh, what startup life is like right it's basically he saying it's like jumping off an airplane and uh, building a parachute on the way down oh, uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and then uh, the goal is to basically just um, not hit the ground <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> yeah all right note note to self delete does not suggest starting a startup no okay. it's it's but... fun it's still like, like skydiving fun right? <laughs> so... yeah that's right there you go there's the plus side of it yeah okay wow that's great so you you've made it you've built your own parachute uh you know it seems like you're uh, or a hang glider even maybe i don't know what you you've built but you've done a, a really nice job so far so anyway can continued success of course with vicarious thank you but uh, what we're really here to talk about today is the second of uh, two recent papers, the, the first of which we uh, talked about last time. So so the second one is all about, well, I'll just read the title, A Detailed Mathematical Theory of Thalamic and Cortical Microcircuits Based on Inference in a Generative Vision Model. And I'll I'll just kind of introduce it here, and then you can correct me, and, we can, and then we can get into it. So the neocortex uh, seems important for our general intelligence, um, however narrow that generality may be, as we were, you know, sort of just discussing. Uh, you have argued that the cortex is, you know, in, on the one hand, you know, the, the important thing to understand. Um, but on the other hand, that, uh, you know, it's, it's the easier bit of brain to understand because the rest of the brain is so complex and specialized, honed through eons of uh, evolution. Okay, so so cortex, um, just to bring everyone to, up to speed, is this big sheet made up of a repeated architectural motif, what's called the cortical column or microcircuit, uh, which is repeated throughout the cortex fairly uniformly, but with variation. Uh, but it, you know, it's the basic uh, organization is similar uh, across cortex. And you've argued that if we knew what it was doing, as many have, that we could apply that and, and then take us a big step forward, not only in understanding our own uh, human intelligence, but in, in building artificial intelligence. And there are many theories of which you have you know, worked on already, uh, but they're based on sort of two, I would say, main approaches. One approach is to think of cortex as sort of a feed-forward, bottom-up series of hierarchical processing. So going from like these simple to more complex and abstract uh, representations. So like in vision, that would be going from like lines and edges, building up to uh, all the way up to an image that you can identify, an object like a, the face of, uh, I don't know, Abraham Lincoln, someone famous, right? The other approach, the one to which you uh, subscribe, is to think of Cortex more as a top-down inference engine, which creates uh, generative models of possible worlds uh, to then best explain the data that is that is coming in to our senses. Am I am I on point so far here? Yes, you are exactly yeah. on point. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do I have to say anything at all here? <laughs> no, no. Just, just. just by the way, the leaps on a the leaps on a treadmill. This is great. He's, uh, this is the first time someone's exercised during the podcast. I love it. So <laughs> it, it's it's great to be standing and uh, walking while talking. That's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should get a treadmill because I, 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 I use a standing desk. Okay. Um, anyway, all right. So, so <laughs> I'm going to continue here. So most focus has been on the canonical cortical microcircuit asking, you know, what does that column do? What does that cortical microcircuit do? Uh, but of course, cortex doesn't act alone in the brain. It's highly interconnected with lots of other brain areas. 
um, in these complicated loops between cortex and and the other brain areas, one of which is the thalamus. And the role uh, or roles of the thalamus has been uh, debated for many a year now. Um, it was originally thought, you know, just to be a relay from our sense organs to the rest of the, the cortex. And it does do that. But, uh, but more recently, it's been thought that it's played a role in attention and the regulation of information flow um, you know, between cortical areas and from our senses uh, to, to those cortical areas. So the circuitry and the loops between the thalamus and the cortex um, have led you know, some people to kind of rethink the canonical microcircuit computation Right. What what is the canonical microcircuit actually computing? Um, so to move beyond just cortex, and it actually involved uh, involved the thalamus. So I had Randy O'Reilly on recently, and he has this uh, deep predictive learning model uh, where there's a feed forward projection to the thalamus from uh, uh, from cortex and a feedback projection to thalamus from cortex. And the idea, and this happens uh, in the pulvinar for in the visuals, at least in the visual system, um, this, these feed forward and feedback connections join together in the, the, the pulvinar and act like a you know a predictive learning mechanism in the mm-hmm. style of this top down predictive coding inference approach. Yeah, and and so and I, I only say that because um, I mean you know this conversation that we're having is is basically the closest thing that uh, that we've talked about on the podcast. Uh, to that is is Randy's predictive um, learning mechanism mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that brings us up to speed now, sort of up to speed. So you had these recursive cortical networks that you've been working with for years. Yeah. And you realized that they could be implemented with networks of neurons. And you realized that you could map the computational uh, properties and the flow of these RCNs onto the cortical column. And thus, the bio RCN was born. Yes. And all right. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. So um, I, we've done this already multiple times, but just really broad overview. Let's just recap what uh, recursive cortical networks are and what you've used them for in the past. Yeah. So recursive cortical networks are a hierarchical generative model for vision. Um, it builds a hierarchy from parts of, for line segments at the bottom, going all the way to object level models at the top and these are all uh, encoded as a probabilistic graphical model and when a new piece of evidence comes in like a scene of characters or scene of objects this um, model can parse that scene as best explanation under the model uh, and we used it for cracking captchas uh, you know defeating their fundamental defense uh, and also we use it uh, regularly in our robotic tasks for cluttered bin picking, uh, detecting boxes, um, all those things. So it's a, it's a it's a uh, vision model that can be used for object recognition, for foreground background segmentation, for estimating pools, for generating from the model, for occlusion reasoning. Um, so it's a, it's a unified generative model on which uh, the different uh, tasks are just different queries on the model rather than having to train specifically for the task. Yeah, have, having to retrain the model, like a deep learning network that you'd need to retrain for every task. Right. I mean, there might be some generality between tasks, but in general, you'd have to retrain it. Yeah. All right, good. So um, so like I said, you, you've taken those RCNs and um, applied them to um, a cortical column and developed the bio RCN. And one of the nice things about um, applying this to a cortical column is that because you already had the the theory basically of the RCN, it makes very specific biological predictions of what needs, like what kind of connections there need to be, and what kind of cells need to be involved, and precise uh, inhibitory and excitatory interactions. And the way that this works, it, it, so so well, maybe maybe you can uh, elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, okay, so so one thing is that you know when we built RCN uh, originally. We were looking at the brain for insights. Um, we were looking at visual cortex for insights to say what kind of structural constraints need to exist in the model. Uh, and mm. uh, uh, so it is not surprising that we will be able to map it back uh, because we started with um, the insights from the brain. But but the insights from neuroscience are clues, all right? They, for example, um, yeah. the idea that surfaces and uh, edges are represented separately, but in an interacting way. 
that that is an idea that uh, came from neuroscience and we triangulated it to some algorithmic principles and properties of the world but then how exactly it gets implemented in, in the graphical model um, that is something we develop in the context of everything else that we are building so we are the, the mathematical model that we are building is filling in a lot of the details based on uh, hints from uh, neuroscience so that mm. um, and the good thing about the final model that it's built is it, it is functionally complete even though it is partial functionality it is not doing everything that visual cortex is now uh, doing and not to the level of uh, performance that the visual cortex is doing but at least it is it is complete it is it is doing the whole thing of parsing a scene and uh, recognizing characters all those things so it is it's a uh, complete functional model uh, so now that means it fills in a lot of the details that are not available uh, you know when you look at uh, initially at uh, biology so now we can go and map map back these computations to um the cortical lamina and columns and again their information from anatomy and physiology uh, all all the experimental data act as constraints in that mapping so you know that for example um feed forward input from the thalamus um mostly lands on layer 4 in in the um in, in the cortical uh, lamina uh, and and if if that falls on layer 4 then the out you know that you, if you place that computation there you know that the next set of computations uh, which are dependent on the projections from layer 4 to layer 2 3 there is only one place to put that right so because right. <laughs> the, uh, so it, it's like solving a jigsaw puzzle biology gives you some set of hints and your model gives you a full set of computations and then it's a question of how do you map these computations and you anchor them based on known uh, data from uh, biology that those becomes your anchoring points the, the corner pieces of the puzzle and then the uh, rest of it is just uh, get gets filled in based on those constraints imposed by this anchoring uh, pieces of data from biology good uh, w- one of the things that uh, you do is so so in the rcn it's a probabilistic graph model um each node in the rcn when you break it into uh, biology is sort of broken into groups of neurons so each uh, each node kind of represents groups of neurons that then you break down mathematically and computationally how they interact and compute uh, and send and then send projections to other nodes that are made of other groups of neurons that do different uh, computations correct so we'll bring thalamus in here in just a bit but uh, let's start with the the cortical uh, micro column yeah you you fashion the cortical micro column as a binary random variable yeah uh, so so yeah so what does that mean um yeah so so one uh, pleasing thing out of this mapping is that it gives us a tool to think about uh, cortical micro column so you can think of a cortical micro column as representing a feature or a concept um, so it can be a cortical micro column represents an edge or a character uh, a uh, at a, at a higher level and then so what do those different uh, lamina in the cortical uh, column do they are all talking about the same feature they you know they are all talking about this one thing uh, whether it's edge or uh, uh, a character but they are talking about different aspects of that thing um, so it could be uh, how does this edge participate in lateral connections with other edges in the same level uh, how does this edge um, decompose itself into smaller edges uh, or how does this edge compose itself in a hierarchy with a in a, you know a corner uh, in the next level uh, in, in in the cortical and these different aspects the participation of that feature in different aspects whether it is laterally hierarchically sequentially etc all these different aspects get represented in different cortical lamina and then um, finally there is this um, need for computing the belief the final belief uh, that each cortical column needs to say am i on or off uh, as part of the overall coherent thing that uh, uh, the visual cortex is trying to explain when when am i part of the best explanation for the scene or not and that is the belief whether that cortical column is finally on or off uh, and that requires integrating information from uh, bottom up evidence lateral evidence top down evidence sequential evidence all of them and all of them are finally combined into a signal saying am i on or off and so that is represented in another lamina so so this mapping gives us this conceptual tool to 
think about what a cortical column is doing. Just to give a really coarse sort of cartoon of this, uh, it could be that, um, you know, in one layer, let's say, uh, you know, layer projections coming into layer four saying, uh, I'm an I'm an edge. Uh, I have edge properties, and then the projections up to layer two, three is like you're an edge, but you're near a surface, uh, and and I'm going to vote on that. And then projections, the, it gets like the context from lateral layers, uh, and so then you have layers one through six, sort of all voting on their specific contextual votes about this one property of the edgeness, and yeah. and then all together they vote on on the whole the thing as a whole correct that's that's perfectly done yes okay <laughs> okay so um uh, I, I mean is it useful sh- sh- should we break down the different roles of the different laminae or you know is that maybe too too fine grained i don't know no we could um so um we could at least try so so one thing um you know this brings up is that when you measure it the right way all the all the neurons in a cortical column will tend to have the same receptive field and and this is of mm-hmm. course observed right uh, but al- also you will see that the receptive fields will change based on the context so initially when you if you are measuring it based on purely bottom up evidence and you just power it through you will you will see that all the different laminae neurons in all the different laminae have the, the same classical receptive field but then depending upon which lamina they are in and depending on what contextual computation they are doing, their classical receptive field can change into something more dynamic and uh, mm-hmm. uh, and something that depends on extra columnar input or uh, inputs that are not directly bottom up for that column, but based on lateral or top down inputs. So uh, if we go lamina to lamina, so in the mapping, um, layer four is of course uh, feed forward input. Uh, layer two three has uh, multiple roles. One is uh, computing um, the lateral connections for contour continuity. Uh, and the other is uh, pooling, just like in a complex cell, uh, pooling information for uh, invariant representation uh, and, and then projecting to uh, the next higher level. And then layer five, it's below layer four, is um, pretty much doing the same computations as layer two, three. But now that layer also includes feedback from above. So um, in, in this mapping, uh, uh, as you mentioned with, uh, before, um, every every node in the probabilistic graphical model needs to have multiple copies in, in a neurobiological implementation because you need to have uh, messages going in different directions being represented by different set of neurons um, because neurons are not bidirectional. And that's why the same computation uh, which happens in the feedforward pathway is also kind of replicated in the feedback pathway because um, mm-hmm. you know one is using purely feedforward information, the other is using a combination of feedforward and feedback information. So layer five is lateral connections and unpooling, uh, so that uses um, the combination of feedforward and feedback information. Uh, and in layer five, also a sub lamina of layer five is involved in belief computation, which uses both feedforward, feedback, lateral, all those things together, and then. Layer six is uh, computing feedback messages to send to uh, the children. So that's the rough breakdown. All right, good. Yeah, um, everybody memorize that. All right, so, yeah, <laughs> it's nice. It's in the paper. And um, um, you know, I mean, I'm just going to start, you know, listing interesting things as we go through here. To, you know, things that are interesting to me. So um, copies. So the clonally related uh, excitatory neurons um, are copies to participate in, in different lateral and, and hierarchical context some um, so so when cortex is developing th- these clonal neurons are they, they all come from like the same neuron essentially when when these neurons are being created and that's what's referred to i believe as as uh, these clonal neurons and uh, so what role do do these copies or clones play uh, within the processing um so this is um, an interesting aspect that kind of falls out of the model and and the mapping uh, it produces to biology you, it, so the model used clones um, in in its representation for uh, representing higher order context, um, and and this is also related to our uh, work on cognitive maps, where you are mm-hmm. using different clones to represent different contexts. So that same idea is also used in RCN, um, and instead of temporal uh, thing, uh, it was in the context of lateral connections. Uh, you know, um, 
is, is this line part of what different curvature, curvatures are a line part of? And representing that in an efficient way uses um, clones in that representation. Um, so, uh, and so, so basically what it means is that um, if you think of these lateral connections as a sequence uh, and, and different, different curvatures are different, different sequences it participates in, then you can mm -hmm. think of it as a, a particular feature, um, which is an edge uh, in this case, has different clones for participating in these different curvatures. And, and uh, that's a very uh, efficient way to represent this higher order uh, lateral context. Um, so that's one place in which these clonal neurons come in. And this, if I am you know, going to speculate forward, this might be a general property of how a cortical column represents higher order information uh, using you know cloning basically Clones. saying you you create different clones for the different higher order context it is participating in whether it is um lateral context uh, based on line continuation or whether it is sequential context based on you know temporal uh, continuation or whether it is based on surface uh, properties uh, so, some uh, you know, so just using different clones for different contexts might be a general property that's one one aspect and there's also another aspect, which is basically saying, irrespective of what a cortical column represents, you need to have some basic computations to be done in that cortical column, which is part of inference, saying, oh, whether it doesn't matter whether it is representing line segment or a character or a you know frequency bin, um, you still need to process feed forward information, uh, combine it with feedback information, lateral information, etc. And and those set of computations imply a particular connectivity, and and those connectivity can be um, wired upfront. You don't need to wait for environmental signals to come in to wire them because those computations are irrespective of what the column represents. So that's this idea of, of establishing some connections a priori in a cortical column that don't need to be learned. They don't need to go undergo any learning. It's just hardwired. Yeah, exactly. And 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 this is also related to the clonal neurons, you know, there are some recent papers uh, which we cite in our, our paper showing that um, a lot of vertical wiring in the cortical column can be established a priori and are established a priori. And maybe those synapses will still retain some plasticity, but um, you don't need that um, plasticity to be the one establishing those connections. Mm, yeah, maybe a lower lower sensitivity to to change, perhaps. Correct. Right. I mean, this is in contrast to the lateral connections uh, between columns, which um, have uh, in the model a, a higher learning capacity, learning sensitivity. Correct. Um, yeah. So the lateral connections are all uh, learned. Um, you know, they, you can, of course, um, genetically project them to an area where they are more likely to make connections. But the, the specific connections it makes to other cortical columns are learned because the definitions of cortical columns themselves are learned, right? Like, you know, so whether a cortical column represents an edge or not is not a, it's something knows a priori. So the, the lateral connections will depend on what those cortical connections, uh, co the cortical columns themselves represent. So they, they have to be learned. So, I mean, this is all about, um, one of the things that I love about this, uh, I've been reading about um, prefrontal cortex. Uh, I, oh, is it passing him in wise? I don't remember, but the, the the overarching theory of the prefrontal cortex function, in their view, is that it's all about context and planning um, actions, but vastly based on the context of multiple different uh, sources of information that are coming in, and that uh, this really fits with that and broadly just these lateral connections because. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. I used to make fun of, uh, there was a postdoc that I used to work with and he was all about context and I used to make fun of him. He's probably much more successful than I am now, but, <laughs> but, but I've come around on it and thinking, wow, it really, really, it really is a, a fundamentally important thing to do to be able to move through the world, uh, is to integrate these different sources of information. And it's all about context. Got it. So maybe we can just go through uh, a, a bit of the the sort of processing, and then this is when we can bring the the thalamus in uh, as well. And you know, of course, this is all detailed in the paper. But um, you know, essentially, there is a a feed forward pass which you already mentioned, and it kind of goes through this sequence of features, laterals, pools, this kind kind of cascade. There's also a feedback pass which is goes through the reverse of those uh, 
features. It cascades in the reverse direction. So it goes pools, laterals, features. And I don't know if you want to comment on the functionality of that. Well, features are detecting co-occurrences, uh, line segments or corners, and uh, laterals are just enforcing continuity between uh, in the in the in a line representations, so contour continuity, and pools are uh, pooling for invariance so that the higher level can be more invariant, and and that's a structure that is repeated in the hierarchy, and um, it's just that it is more formulated as a generative model so that you can sample from the model and um, also pay top-down attention, control um, uh, things with top-down attention, etc. And that's kind of the core of the RCN, right? So there's this forward pass, and then they're in the, uh, going to the to the top, and then there's the top-down attention feedback pass yeah. that then hones in on the correct answer. Is that, that the way? Is that a way to put it? Okay. Uh, yes, um, it, it is uh, comes I, iteratively to the the correct answer. Uh, yeah, it refines refines the feed uh, the the bottom up projections and refines it into the the top down generate into a generative uh, fashion. So I'm just stumbling over my words here. Okay, so so th- that's kind of the core of the RCN. Uh, and now let's bring the, the thalamus in because there's this uh, cortical thalamo cortical pathway, yeah. which you um, describe as explaining away, uh, yeah. where the thalamus is implementing these, um, explaining away these or uh, factors. Mm-hmm. Uh, m- maybe you could describe that. Yeah. So when you are uh, when you have multiple things modeled. Uh, in your in your model uh, or in the brain, um, so you, so you can think of it as each thing you are modeling, whether it is an edge or uh, whether it is an object, it is specifying how it generates the input. Um, so when you think of an edge, it's basically saying, okay, when I if I if I activate this edge feature, it will generate this pix- this set of pixels in the world, uh, and if it's an A. It's basically specifying if I if I poke this node, it is it will generate these pixels in the world. And now, of course, uh, many of these things are interconnected. If you uh, poke an edge and an adjacent edge, then uh, they will they will overlap in the fields that they generate, right? They, 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 some set of pixels um, will be overlapping between an edge and adjacent edge when you try to generate them. Um, and then when when you actually do inference in the real world, you need to find that which subset of these need to be on um, because some of the evidence will be overlapping between them. Um, and we have some examples of this happening in CAPTCHAs where when you look mm-hmm. locally, uh, because uh, because of the juxtaposition between these characters, you can you can start seeing uh, characters in between the, uh, char- uh, some, some of these characters. For example, when you bring an r and n n close to each other it can look like an m um, and uh, um, so so all the locally the evidence for that character might be very strong in the in the global parsing of the scene that evidence is um, just a hallucination and needs to be explained away and and mm-hmm. so this is you know this is the core idea called explaining away which is which is which happens in probabilistic graphical models naturally if you if you formulate it the right way and uh, when you're parsing a scene, yes, you definitely need to explain away local evidence using the global uh, context. Um, and uh, not only that, it, it's not a computation that happens just at the uh, the first level. This needs to happen between every every level in the hierarchy. So from V1 to V2, uh, from V2 to uh, V4, you need to have these explaining away computations because uh, v, it, the things that are modeled in V2 also have overlaps in V1, and you need to uh, you need to explain them away uh, in a hierarchy. Um, and these explaining away computations exist in uh, RCN uh, because it's a it's a computational requirement. If you want to come to global uh, consensus, you need to explain away local evidence. So it's it's something we had to put in there because that that's the only way to make the model work. And then <laughs> when we worked back from that to see where it would fit in this cortical mapping. There was no place to fit it other than in the thalamus, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and and not only that, it it turned out to be a very very good mapping uh, to uh-huh. what uh, the computations uh, the thalamus is doing. And I would say 
based on this uh, mapping, it kind of starting to make sense why it would be implemented in the thalamus and uh, why uh, it is related to other projections to the thalamus, etc. So, so, so basically, if you think about what what this explaining away computation does, it's gating of feed forward information based on feedback information. That's that's fundamentally when you when you look at what is happening in in a um, subset of neurons uh, or or in a node in RCN when you pass messages um, for explaining away, it's routing of bottom up evidence based on uh, top down support. So uh, if you have if a node has uh, two two parents pointing to it as both both are causal influence on this node being on. So uh, a pixel can be on due to parent A or parent B. And now evidence comes in um, from what I'm saying. Oh, the, the, this pixel should be on uh, point 0.9. That's a, that's likelihood of this pixel being on. Now you have to make a decision locally on how to share that piece of evidence among the parents. You should do, should you basically say, oh, point 0.9 goes to parent A or, or point 0.9 goes to parent B, or is it a fraction of them? You know, half of point 0.9 mm -hmm. goes to parent A, or, and and this is depends on. How much other support does parent A or parent B have? So if, if somebody says parent B, so, you know, from elsewhere in the network, you know that parent B is the one likely to be on, then you, you pass all the evidence to parent B and you give very little to parent A. So it's, it's, so it's based on this, um, top down information that you get from these parents on how much support they have from elsewhere in the network. You decide to route this bottom up information. So that is the fundamental computation that is happening in this explaining away circuit. And that fits very well with what, uh, Sherman and Guillory and, um, many other people have found out about the thalamic, uh, circuits. Like the feedback connections from, from layer six in the cortex projecting back to the thalamus. How, so it's almost like a center, um, center on, uh, mechanism. Although it's not um, anatomically set up the same way, how how is um how is explaining away then related to attention? Because you're you were saying top down, and that that's like an yeah. attentional kind of mechanism. Is it yeah. attention, or how does it relate? So attention, you can think of it as a very special case of explaining away. So this explaining away is a mechanism where the parents can be kind of half on or half off they don't have to be full they don't have to commit to being fully on or fully off all right and mm -hmm. uh, and and even then this computation happens but now suppose you you set a parent to be off or a set a parent to be on then that is hard exp I, I would call it hard explaining away and uh, so that is attention so basically you're saying oh i want i want the computations to happen under the assumption that the letter a is on that that would um, so, so turning that letter uh, yeah on top down will basically change the nature of explaining away computations happening at the at the lower level. So the explaining away is happening anyway, but then the that attention is. can have an effect on top of the explaining away. Exactly. One of the worst one of the worst times I had coming down off of acid, I was uh, I I was laying in bed trying to sleep and still like my mind couldn't stop, you know, and I, I saw this like cylindrical green thing made up of almost like minecraft like blocks minecraft uh -huh. didn't exist back then but it like kept spinning and spinning and and kept these blocks kept coming in and adding to it and adding to it it was driving me insane but this what i'm wondering is uh <laughs> first of all what's your worst experience on acid no what i'm wondering is uh, if, if you didn't have these explaining away mechanisms uh my guess is it would be like an acid trip where you where everything is super local and you can't um, sharpen anything, right? You can't have the global features. It's all, you can't filter anything out basically. And everything is present and interacting. How does that sound? Uh, well, that all sounds, uh, reasonable. Uh, this is, yeah, something <laughs> I have to extend the theory to, you know? <laughs> the theory. Oh yeah. Because, uh, right. Psychedelics are back. You could <laughs> right, maybe right. a therapeutic use for explaining away. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I haven't, uh, dwelled much on that one, especially this idea of, <laughs> Feeding uh, the the top down input back into the network, right? So basically, this is where there is no sensory input. Your uh, your eyes are closed, and uh, right. and the system is running on its own. So you you are develop you know generating your top down input and effectively feeding it back into your uh, uh, net, uh, network. And uh, yeah, that that's you know that is a 
uh, obviously some amount of mixing of top down and bottom up is happening all the time in the network but uh, where you cut off the uh, bottom up to uh, totally and feed it back in that's something we haven't explored much in detail but i would i would love to because of the uh, uh, connections to psychedelics and uh, on, or <laughs> also because of the uh, connections to some other uh, you know uh, things like um, uh, schizophrenia or uh, you know where 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 we start mixing what is real versus what is what, what is yeah. hallucinated right so that would be an interesting direction in which to take this model uh, we haven't done anything that but you know that that is a uh, interesting uh, way to look at it that is interesting I, i'll have to introduce you to my friend i have a friend a few states away who's he's growing his own mushrooms psychedelic uh -huh. mushrooms he keeps sending me these pictures you know i uh -huh. haven't done psychedelics in a long time but i'll i'll, I'll uh I'll hook you up with okay, him. How about great. that? That's the language of the the kids. Uh, but so so anyway, these uh, just bringing it back a moment because so so your story then uh, the story of of your model here is that these feedback pr projections from the cortex uh, come onto thalamus and uh, have these explaining away mechanisms. Um, and Randy O'Reilly's story is yeah. that. The feedback projections, same same feedback projections, but in this case, they are they are comparing the prediction, the generative prediction, with the bottom up information, and yours is as well. But in his case, it's a story about learning how off the prediction is, uh, and then that's how plasticity happens within these circuits. the 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 difference, but the temporal difference between the prediction and the bottom up gets sent uh, and and drives the learning in in cortex. And I I don't see a problem for both of these things to be correct. I'm not sure how you, that, how, what you think. That's right. Um, so I don't see why both can't be correct. And especially in our model, we don't we don't talk about the learning part at all, right? We are we are right. only talking about um, the inference side. Um, you know, once the model is learned, how does inference happen? So um, I won't be surprised if learning involves uh, some mechanism like uh, Aureli is suggesting there, based on uh, error between the prediction from uh, one layer uh, and the other, how the synapses are uh, adapted. Um, I won't be surprised there. Uh, and so they can be both be compatible. But I do want to make a, a contrasting statement between what our model is doing and this generally accepted idea about predictive coding. Uh -huh. Yeah. So predictive coding is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a popular word in neuroscience uh, and uh, it's uh, used everywhere. Every every model is a predictive coding model <laughs> <That's> <laughs> of, right. of, uh, of uh, everything. You know, right? yeah. Hippocampus is a predictive coding model. Uh, you know, visual cortex is a predictive coding model. So this a pretty predictive coding uh, thing is thrown out in, the, in, in just just a, a word that is just overused everywhere. It's a bonanza. You could say it's a bonanza these days of right. predictive coding in the yes. literature. Yeah, right. Um, but when you when you look at what actually predictive coding, uh, if you go back to the uh, literature and uh, look at what predictive coding entails, it's um, so this is during inference, right? We are not talking about learning. This is during inference. Uh, it needs to subtract the top-down input from the bottom-up uh, information. So and then mm -hmm. only the errors between the top-down prediction and the um, and the bottom-up input are passed up. That's actual computation. Um, if uh, if you want to um, map what that word to an actual computation does, but that computation uh, of subtracting the top-down uh, predictions from bottom-up input makes many restrictive assumptions. It's basically assuming that um, your model is uh, linear and your noise is Gaussian, and it's only in that setting the subtracting the top-down predictions from bottom-up input makes sense. And uh, I would say this might go back to uh, one of the first papers on predictive coding, which was from uh, Raj, Rajesh Rao. Uh, this was a nature neuroscience paper. Uh, but then that idea got stuck, uh, basically saying, oh, this idea that you should subtract top-down predictions uh, from bottom-up input is the right way to do things that somehow That's got the stuck. Way. Right. Yeah. But it is not. Um, what you want to do is combine bottom-up input with uh, top-down. You you want to say top down input influences top down prediction influences how bottom up information is sent sent up but it is not a subtraction sometimes it can be uh, an amplification of uh, compatible regions so 
if uh, top down prediction agrees with bottom up input you you keep those things around you pass those up where where there is a mismatch you can kill off the bottom up input um so so it is and and it depends on the the particular context in which the computation is happening whether it is based on top down attention whether it is just software explaining away uh, so it is a it's a richer story than just subtract top down input from uh, bottom up uh, evidence um and i would call it more uh, rather than calling it predictive coding uh, it's probabilistic inference uh, what is happening is probabilistic inference of combining um, bottom up and top down information and that can look like subtraction in some settings it can look like amplification in some other settings and in reality it will be a mix of both of those things hmm. so so you have the model and um it's not just a model it does things it accounts for things and and you talk you go through multiple uh visual phenomena that it that it accounts for in in the paper and i'll just let you choose um maybe maybe you can just describe one of the phenomena that it accounts for and and just a little bit about how it does so yeah um so one of the phenomena uh, that we explain uh in and and replicate in our paper is uh the subjective contour effect and subjective contour effect is where uh you see parts of an object as uh the bottom up stimuli uh but the rest of the object is filled in top down and you actually hallucinate things that do not exist in the real world and this is the famous kanitsa triangle example uh is in the most salient thing i can think of uh in this uh category where what you're seeing bottom up in terms of the real evidence is just these three pacman like figures which are the corners of the triangle but uh your brain actually hallucinates you interpret the the image as a triangle uh sitting on top of three circular disks that is your interpretation of the uh image and then your brain uh in its vast wisdom actually hallucinates uh as uh, you know the three edges of the triangle and you when when you look at this uh an image like that you actually perceive a faint line and that line is not there uh, the the faint line is delineating the triangle the shape right, of the triangle right. yeah and that faint line is completely created by your brain uh and so this is something that fits very well with the theory because uh this is this hallucinating something that doesn't exist is inference it's part of inference because that hallucination is part of the best explanation that the brain is you know cooking up for the scene um so the, in if you are thinking in terms of cortical columns uh yeah. it will basically so you can basically say what happens in the cortical column in that location where there is no bottom up evidence that that cortical column is looking at a segment of the uh, portion of the image where there is nothing it just blank and then it is hallucinating a line there so you can think of what happens as part of the dynamics there when when bottom up input comes in uh layer 4 neurons will be essentially silent saying nothing nothing to see here a uh, blank image right but later on when the context kicks in and the the, the top down and the la- lateral context kick in um and that's the the lateral context in this case would be so you'd have um and correct me if i'm wrong you'd have like a receptive field uh for one cortical column or something in that blank spot where there is no line but yeah. then next to it because it's a topographical map in in the cortex let's say next to it is the edge of one of those pacman shapes uh and so it's getting that context that there is this edge near me uh even though i'm blank and and that's sort of a feed forward uh pass through with the context right correct and and then yeah. it will also be compatible with the the final decision arrived at the top which is uh, oh it's a triangle so there will be top down information saying that oh it's a triangle that means all these columns in between should be on and at first it's kind of like oh, i think it might be a triangle uh, oh no and then it goes and goes oh it's a tri- it's a tri- it's a triangle correct. right and then exactly. and then it really clamps it down correct and and so and so you can think of what will happen in in that cortical column initially it will say oh blank nothing to see here but then as the lateral uh, context and top down context gets incorporated suddenly neurons in this other lamina which are responsible for representing those aspects of computation of that cortical column will turn on and then finally when you look at the belief of that um, column it should basically say oh, i am on and and I'm on. Yeah. Uh, and and similarly the belief neurons in 
in the outer edges of the pacman which is the, the the circular parts of the pacman it should say they are off because uh, you know that's not part of the explanation of the triangle if you are paying attention only to the triangle so if you if you basically are clamping the triangle at the top then the the circular parts of the pacman should turn off and you should be able to see that in the in the cortical column so and that's effect, effectively what we are doing what we are doing is virtual neurophysiology it's it's almost like we <laughs> we have a a uh, functioning monkey in the lab and we can show its stimuli <laughs> and uh, basically record from different different layers and uh, and and show this is how uh, information settles and this is how it arrives at the final answer and you can extend this to um, not just um, the kanitsa triangle um, explanations and subjective contour explanation in our model mostly uses just the contour model but you can also extend it to an illusion called the neon color spreading illusion which also mm-hmm. is it's a it's a um two layered illusion you, there are subjective contours in it uh, because it is hallucinating edges um not only that it's also hallucinating the color inside the the circle uh, and and well uh, and it's interesting that the color hallucination respects the hallucinated edges the, the color doesn't bleed right. out of the edges <laughs> so right. Uh, uh, right. so it is it is um um it's interesting in that way and uh, and um so we can replicate the dynamics of that too and uh, hopefully it's also making some predictions about how that illusion also comes into effect uh, this reminds me of, so steve grossberg has work on this sort of color spreading uh, and respecting right. the boundaries of the neon thing as well and it's it looks like it's uh you know along the same lines um right. c- explanatorily yes um i was I, I while you were talking i was just thinking about like the Necker cube and there and these phenomena where your conscious uh, experience of something switches right on this slow right. time scale. Yes. Yeah, have you thought about that and how that might fit into the model? Yes, uh, we have actually. In fact, uh, we have several examples like that in uh, in the lab at a uh, Vicaria Square. Uh, cool. In, in okay. fact, precisely the Necker cube uh, one. Uh, oh. We have we have created uh, that one and, and replicated it. Just did not get it into the uh, paper. And yeah, so there's a Necker cube one. The face was illusion. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. so um, there are a few of them. Yeah, yeah handful yeah, of them like that. Right. Yeah. And 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 uh, you can make them flip by just randomly perturbing the network, or you could also even see uh, because we have full access to the model. You can also see which nodes should I perturb. If you if you want to do the minimum amount of perturbation, which nodes in the network should I perturb so that I I flip the um, illusion uh, flip the explanation to the other other uh, uh, other thing um so yeah those are uh, fascinating illusions to play with uh, because they are all uh, i would say results of doing inference on a on a model to the inference to the best explanation yeah right delete this is great stuff uh, as always I, i mean you must be very confident in in the model <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, a, a healthy, let's say a healthy <laughs> skeptic's confidence, perhaps. That's you know? right. Yeah. You don't want to be uh, <laughs> too confident. You, uh, yeah, my philosophy is that you want to be the the uh, most skeptical about your own, your, your own model because you, I mean, and only you can be because you know what works and uh, all the nitty gritties of what works and what uh, doesn't work, right? And uh, I mean, it's it's in the right direction, I would say. Uh, there are so many things to be worked on and improved, and uh, some fundamental problems to be fixed. Uh, and we will be tackling all of those as we go. But I would say the the general direction in which we are going, I am very confident about that. Yeah, it's a it's the uh, Richard Feynman quote, right? That the first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. So it sounds like you have that. Uh, right attitude yeah, yeah. <laughs> when is when when are we going to see this thing published in uh nature it's on what archive right now right <laughs> yeah or, um uh, we still have to uh do a little bit more work uh, <laughs> for cleaning it up and uh submit so we haven't submitted it yet um so oh, you haven't okay no uh so we yeah so i hope to submit it in in the coming month so if you have feedback i can i can use it and if any of you any of your listeners have feedback uh i can use it before submitting and uh, maybe it will help uh, smooth the uh, process. Oh, wonderful. All right. So there you go, listeners. Dalip has put the call out for, uh, feedback. So Dalip, um, thanks again. So if, if we, if, uh, we keep this current 
trajectory. I'm not sure this if it follows like a power law distribution of our uh, podcast rate, but I'm I'm pretty sure that we should have another episode in a, uh, probably about two hours from now. Uh, <laughs> might be a little bit longer than that, but it's but it's always fun, and I really appreciate you coming on, and I wish you success going forward. Of course, uh, uh, thanks, Paul. It is it is always uh, fun to be on this one. And uh, no, I don't intend to come back in the next two hours. Now, uh, I, <laughs> I think I have talked too much. I need to go and uh, uh, get some work done. That's what I should do. <laughs> Great. Happy working, my friend. Take okay. care. Thank you. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.